Welcome again. My name is Christian. For those that I haven't um, talked to you previously, heard my voice, you can see Dave there as well. I'll, I'll introduce Dave uh, in a second. Context, for those who haven't joined, this is webinar three of three, essentially. Webinar one was a quick intro around HRO, some general themes, and then we had some, some I'll call it surface level Q&A related to that. Webinar two, on the, two, two weeks ago, we went a lot deeper in the content and Dave really went deep on the principles or as deep as we can go within 20 minutes. And if you need copies of that, uh, you know, the recordings are on YouTube. And if you contact Christina, you can get copies of the, the slide packs as well. And this is now three and we're really now just honing in on those, those questions. Context and background. Uh, so for those, this is the third time round. you've heard this a few times. We had the Brady Report released December 2019. And one of the things called out there was adopting the principles of high reliability organisational theory. And there's a lot of people in the industry scratching their heads for what does that mean? Um, what does that look like? How can we move forwards? And that's what where we've, we've come with these webinars to really help industry in that space, understand what it is, talk to an expert like Dave, um, and then move forwards. And, um, and then also there's been a recent update there on the 21st of, of May, and I'll, I'll swing over to yourself, Dave, just to quickly talk about that. Yeah, I'm sure everyone on the call is aware of um, the independent parliamentary inquiry that's um, kicked off. I'm sure everyone's aware that Professor Andrew Hopkins has been appointed as the independent mind safety expert. I mentioned in one of the early ones that he written this book, Learning from High Reliability Organisations in 2010. Um, he's done a lot of reviews into a lot of these incidents in, in mining, including Maurer, but also oil and gas, including Macondo and Texas City, Longford uh, in Australia. So I'm going to have a go now and tell you what I think is going to be at least the top six or seven recommendations and go on record and maybe we can cycle back around in November and see how close I am. Um, he's going to talk about organisational structure. So his latest book, Structure Creates Culture. He will look at who does the head of safety at a mine report to and ensure that it doesn't report to the mine manager that that role reports offsite um, to a senior um, health and safety manager. He, he believes in functional organisations and he believes that engineering and safety needs to um, be independent from the line. So expect a recommendation about organisational structures for the industry or for organisations um, operating in the industry. Expect a big discussion about engineering risk management practices. So very big on practices like HAZOP and safety in design and a lot of these processing industry um, risk management practices. Um, I don't know the application of all of those process safety management techniques in the mining industry, but he will talk a lot about those. Um, those how, how did the design of the Grosvenor mine get, um, get approved? Um, how did the, the risk of methane get kind of like designed out um, at, at the start of the project. So he'll talk about that. He'll talk a lot about performance. So recommendation two, probably recommendation three will be performance metrics and, and give the industry a hard time on LTIs and, and, and TRIFA. Um, he'll look into incentives for managers and he'll give your managers a hard time on whether they're incentivized for um, injury reporting and things like that um, and, and go down that space. He will um, talk about reporting cultures and weak signals and near misses and the level of reporting that goes on in the organisation and the blame that, that is apportioned around that, um, that reporting. He's very big on open reporting cultures. And then he'll talk to his, his saying, which he sort of coined, which was, you know, chronic unease, which was um, the extension of, of collective mindfulness or what we've talked about in the HRO theory and talk a lot about the HRO theories. So I'd probably say you'll, you'll have something about structures, something about risk management practices um, in engineering, something about performance metrics, something about executive bonuses, something about your reporting um, of near misses and, and, and other issues, and then a raft of HRO related recommendations. Um, if I was to guess, and looking at his last 25 years of work. But we'll see. Yeah. Dave, that's, that's really useful um, and insightful there. And, and I guess, Looping back to the request for everyone around questions, maybe there might be something that's that's fallen out of that description there from Dave that you might want to um, understand further, or we might want to talk further about later in the, the call. So for those who joined us again uh, up front, interested if 
top two challenges you can see with HR implementation in, in your organisation, which we can loop back further, or if you've got anything general around HRO implementation. And I can see there's a few questions there, one from, from Dan, thanks for that. Well, Dave's already started speaking, but uh, so for those who've been on, on the, the two previous webinars, um, you've, you've heard this spiel again. So Dave's the Managing Director at ForgeWorks, uh, Junked Research Fellow at Griffith, uh, he's got a really good podcast, the Safety of Work podcast, which can't recommend highly enough, which really looks at evidence-based practice, uh, which is really good and, and great to understand. Uh, you know, he's done oil and gas construction and rail for 20 years. He's got a PhD in safety science and is a fellow at the Australian Institute of Health and Safety. And, and I think we'd all agree that he's got a very good ability for breaking down complex ideas into to simple themes and easy to understand. And uh, certainly we've got a lot of good feedback uh, previously, Dave. So uh, thanks again for joining us. And uh, we're looking forward to tonight as well. Okay, so one question uh, which did fall out of the last, last webinar, but I think it's probably very useful now, certainly for those that maybe haven't been on the previous ones and in the context now about thinking about implementation. Dave, I, th I know you mentioned this on in webinar one, but maybe you can just loop back on, on this and the, the where to start, you know, things to think about. Look, yeah, let's talk about that. And then I see that um, Daniel and Bobby have put something in the chat, so we'll, we'll go straight to them. Look, we talked about the five principles of HRO theory. Um, so let, um, I suppose if I wanted to start with, um, they, you know, the idea of preoccupation with failure is a bit esoteric, like it's a bit hard to say, let's all be more worried. Um, this deference to expertise becomes complicated because it's like where, who and where and how and um, even commitment to resilience it is, is so, so those three um, are less tangible. So two in the middle, which is um, sensitivity to operations and reluctance to simplify. So if, if you wanted to start, I'd look at those, which is how well do we know what's happening in our operation? which is sensitivity to operations. So, so how do we know how well is happening? How do we know how our decisions are gonna impact the operation? Um, and then when we get information back about our operation in terms of reporting or, or, or issues or challenges, what do we do with th that information we get? Do we just you know brush it aside or do we just say, oh, well, it's just another one of these or, or do we do something about it? So if I was gonna suggest where to start is starting with your feedback loop around operations with, you know, how well do you understand what's going on? And with the information that you get, you know, how well do you investigate and or investigation in a, in a broad sense? How well do you, how much effort do you put into understanding exactly what's going on and, and how the organization can support? So I think that, um, I, I think that's where I'd start. Um, the, the easiest place to start is to just get people boots on the ground in the field, understanding what's going on and understanding how what they do can, can help or hinder um, um, people to do their work on the ground. Um, and then when they get information um, from the operation, um, taking it seriously and doing something with it and providing support. So that'd be kind of where I'd start. If we just roll into the chat, Christian, I'm assuming you're just going to let me roll through the chat. And if it becomes too out of control, then um, you, we can just kind of filter it. Yeah, um, yeah, Dave. I think, I think Daniel, look, um, the main challenges will be buy-in from stakeholders. I think that's always the case. Um, Two, two things here is, is providing a, a clear direction on where to start and showing your organization that is building on existing work. If, if people think they have to throw everything up that they've been currently doing and start afresh, then there's a lot of cynicism around that. There's a lot of cost and effort around that. So, so, so figuring out what you can do to build on what you've got and, and how you can take the first step. And some of that, like I just said then, which is, um, you know, it, some of these ideas in HRO theory, like I said in one of the early webinars, they're not actually that hard to sell um, because if you actually do them well, you're going to actually build a, a more aligned organization, a better um, integrated and communicating organization. You're going to provide an organization that is more focused on your core operation on the ground. Um, so, so there's a lot of benefits to just kind of running your business um, or running your operation with, with HRO theory. So, and using simple language, not, not, not getting caught up in, in philosophy and, theory like you know some of the other theories of safety differently or safety too or resilience engineering or even high reliability organizations just talking about you know the next three or four steps that you're going to take to improve your your safety management 
um, and, and drawing those sort of clear practical steps out. You know, people may not even realize that you're doing anything um, that's, that's that different to what they, they think you should be doing anyway. Um, I don't know that, that if that's, if that's um, answered the question, Daniel, but I think in these things, um, starting small and building momentum is, is, is the way to kind of initiate change in my experience in, in larger established organizations. Dave, I'll, I'll jump in there too. I, I wonder, there's probably some opportunities as well in, in ways and things around how we go about safety that would probably, um, you know, you, you, I guess you could frame it such that of the value add you will get, which as, as you say, it's probably not going to be a hard sell if you, if you look at those themes that are really pertinent and relevant to the operation. Um, and, and get your buy-in at a lower level as well. You know, I, I don't, you know, don't need to spend a whole lot of time, you know, talking about every little thing that you're going to do with your EGMs and, and, and your senior management, you know, talk at your mind management level and your operations management level and, and, and they'll understand these, these, um, the things that you're trying to do. And if you're trying to understand their world better and, and, and provide them with better support, then, um, you know, you'll probably get a good ear from them. I think, Bobby, look, I'm I'm pretty naive when it, and and ignorant when it comes to the regs uh, in the in the mining space. So um, forgive me for that. I know you got your SSE roles, and I know that those roles need to have all of the resources they need to manage safety on the mine site. So I suppose from a reg point of view, and maybe even a regulator point of view, being an independent parliamentary inquiry, you know, it, Hopkins sort of was the expert in the Royal Commission in into Longford in Australia. I don't think he's going to care too much. You may even you may even see a couple of recommendations in there about the role of the regulator and regulation. So it, I think you know the regulator might not like what gets written, but um, but I I'd be incredibly surprised given his last book that he just published this year on structures create cultures, um, and his book on my, I'd be very surprised if he doesn't put a really strong line in around that how that lands in your industry and and your regulators I suppose you guys will know better than better than me um so it will be fascinating and interesting if that's you know given not if but um I wasn't aware of that being the case so safety and incentivized um so look I mean Hopkins I suppose is being pretty critical of of LTIs and TR um, total recordable injuries. He's written actually some really good papers. He's probably written the best paper on lagging and uh, like a summary paper of lagging and leading indicators. Um, he's so he's he's he'd be very much against um, um, lagging indicators as safe, safety incentives, as it, as as his view will be. It will distract people from the catastrophic risks that exist within the business. What he's actually going to say about um, financial incentives or production incentives in the absence of those safety incentives, I don't know. And again, I'm, I'm just speculating. I'm just trying to throw a, um, for my own, I suppose, interest, throw some darts at the dartboard and see whether or not I can predict um, what's likely to come out of this inquiry. Um, people like like me as well, who've, who've been thinking about this for a while, like all of you guys who work in this space for a while, like Professor Hopkins, who's, who's done this for 40 years, um, his views have been, you know, his has been kind of um, a, a pretty clear to everyone now. So, um, look, I, I think he'll say something about about industry measuring safety performance by injury rates and 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 blinding the industry and and the potential to blind the industry to catastrophic risks like these. You know, he'll talk about the forty plus um, methane excursions, and I know that's not the picture. Um, given the response that I've seen from Anglo around it. But um, yeah, I, I think we'll see something about incentives. Um, um, oh, geez, Anton, sorry, mate. Um, the 14 principles from Toyota Lean Manufacturing Philosophy, I do not know them. If you want to rattle them off, then we can have a mapping exercise. But I, I know that there's a lot of overlap between, um, between well, look, Kaizen, Lean Six Sigma, um, a lot of these quality management tools and continuous improvement tools that focus on deep understanding of process and consultation with the people who do the work um, and, and optimizing processes for quality and efficiency and, and so on is, is not that different by intent, um, I suppose. Um, I think the HRA theory is a little bit broader than that, but I think you'd you'd find a bit of overlap between the the quality and the 
um, lean manufacturing philosophies and the HRO principles, which basically says, understand your work, involve the people who do the work and, and optimize your processes. Um, I think the challenge is in complex organizations as opposed to manufacturing organizations uh, is that the process is more dynamic and less stable than a manufacturing environment. So the risk is if you over prescribe the way that work needs to happen, given it varies so much every day on a mine site, you may actually create um, create risk um, in that people expecting everything to be the same when it's not. So I think you're gonna to need to have a broader perspective for um, the application to the mining sector, but there is gonna be some overlap. Um, all right, cool, Anton, well mate, give us a call if you started a PhD on the impact of lean on safety. Um, I would love to talk about that with you. Um, Andy, mate, welcome. Um, Okay, um, deferring to expertise and and people's perception of their own expertise, particularly in management roles. Um, and so that is the case, I'm sure, in mining organisations, in heavy industry and engineering organisations where people in senior decision-making roles have done a lot of the roles of the people working in their organisation underneath them. They may have once been the head of engineering, they may have once been a maintenance manager, they may have once potentially even been a, a, a safety, a mine safety manager, who knows. So, so they're going to have a view of their own um, expertise and their own competence to make certain decisions. And, and I suppose, Andy, that can, um, people can be, be confident in their own abilities that they understand um, to make decisions. So, that, so, so, so that's sort of an individual thing. I don't know how organisations deal with that other than putting formal decision-making um, processes in place, technical authority processes in place that have claim over certain decisions that certain line managers can't make without without consultation with certain groups and certain authorities. Um, but in the absence of, of that, you've either got to have a, a leadership capability mindset type of program that helps leaders understand the value of fresh perspectives and diverse viewpoints and, and, and that their, their experience may be stale um, and not current. So you can either have a program around your leaders to help them be aware of that, or you can have and or you can have formal processes and practices in your organization that force them to, to engage other people as they're making decisions. Um, it's probably the best I can do with that, Andy, but you've probably got a pretty good um, idea about um, how to address that as well. Safety differently and HROs. Um, so look, there's a, there's, um, I think I mentioned in one of the early webinars, HRO emerged in the, in the, mid 80s it was the first theory that talked about the presence of of, of capacity um, and, and what those capacities might be to create safe and reliable operations and then a lot of theories followed that like i said um, in a timeline i think in the first webinar resilience engineering in the early 2000s safety two in the late in around 2008 safety differently in about 2012 and more recently we've seen hop or human and organizational performance um, be be around there's a venn diagram that that's got strong overlaps in in all of these theories they all come out of the similar schools of thought and and similar early early research research from sort of i think i mentioned from three mile island in 1979 and then those incidents in the 80s involving um aviation and aerospace and oil and gas um and shipping and logistics and so on so look they all come out of the same place they've all got some slightly different emphasis um, so look, I think, I think I'd be more focused on what you want to do rather than what theory you want to follow. So safety differently got some pretty good language. So your people are your solution and where I said, you know, sensitivity to operations. So there's, there's some strong overlap in, in the ideas. Um, so, so draw out of, I'd draw out of all those theories. I'd, I'd, I'd have a working understanding of, of all of those theories and use that to form the views of what you want to do. And then when you go into your organization, don't worry about talking about safety differently or safety too about HRO. Talk about what you want to do um, and why you want to do that. Um, and, and why you want to do that is because of the impact it'll make on the organization, not why you want to do it because that's what the theory says to do. Um, so I hope that's answered that question. Um, and we're out of questions. So. That's so, it's all right, Dave. We've cool. got some um, some other ones prepped. Normally, I give like fifteen minute answers to things. So I'm actually yes. trying to make sure that everyone right. on the call can get their question in, um, on the table if they um, if they've got one. Right. So um, 
I see Ben's just flicked through a question. Well, we'll come to that after this one. Um, so I've, I've penned this one together, again, looking across the industry. So, so certainly mine is going through a bit of a generational change there. Um, and certainly even, even from a gender perspective, there's a lot of, a lot of influx, you know, of the female agenda as well. So, and we're seeing some um, experienced people retire, move contracting um, or completely exit business. Um, you know, we hear a lot now about loss of corporate knowledge. Um, and then now, in this, now thinking about deferring expertise, you know, what, what are some things that maybe we can be thinking about um, in this space about, about capturing or, def, you know, deferring to these people or, you know, something in and around that space, Dave. So interested in any ideas you might have there. Yeah, um, this is, organisations make this pretty hard, corporate corporate knowledge and knowledge retention and knowledge management projects and, and all of this stuff. I, I kind of don't see it as as that hard and complicated. Um, maybe, I, maybe I'm missing something, but... Um, you know what knowledge is important to you as an organization and and most of its operational knowledge and 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 what you need to do to manage your production and to manage your risk um so so that operational knowledge is is kind of from a hro perspective some of the most important so you know you can do this um a couple of ways you can you can start by looking at you know what knowledge is important within your operation um, and typically that's going to be kind of how how equipment operates and 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 how the process works and um, and so on and and you know just making sure that you've got a good um, a good program of development of people through your through your operation at various stages of their career I'd look at individual teams and and if there was teams where okay we got we got 10 people in that team and they're all in their 60s I would go okay well um, there's an issue here because let's say knowledge doesn't just sit in one person knowledge sits within functions and within teams so you know, doing a mapping exercise of, of, of looking at your operational teams and, and looking at their experience um, of the people in the roles and, and have you got a range of people at different levels of their career and you, can, and you can form some views about some of the transfer of knowledge that might be going on organically within your business and, and look for kind of red flags in that space. Um, so, so that's kind of, kind of one way. Um, the, F, the idea of trying to capture that knowledge in as institutional knowledge, I don't know I've ever seen that done well, which is basically taking all the important knowledge out of people's heads and writing it down. Um, as soon as you write it down, it becomes, it, it becomes obsolete. You know, who's going to update it tomorrow, the next day, the next week? You know, people are able to update their, you know, we update our, our models of risk and our operation through our experience every minute, every, every day. So your knowledge, that, that knowledge is always going to reside in your people. Um, so I think that's an assumption that I'd, I'd have. And then how you, how you kind of figure out to make sure it keeps passing from person to person and, and team to team is important. So, you know, that's, that's probably the best that I can do that. I, I'd focus at the operational level. I'd focus by kind of looking across critical functions and, and critical teams. Um, if you've got, and I, have you got the idea in the business of safety critical roles? where you actually map the critical activities that go on to manage your major accident event risks. And then you, you've identified the critical roles and capabilities that perform those critical activities in like a process safety management um, idea, then that's a great way to look for the points of, you know, are we going to lose those people and how do we put organizational change processes around um, changing in and out those people. Um, but they'd be ways that I'd think about starting that. Now I'm going to go to Ben's question about maturity curves now. Um, all right. So not that I'm aware of in terms of, I'm okay. So Ben's asking, I'm assuming that people are kind of, I've got their chat open and they can kind of see the questions that I'm seeing. Cause I apologize. I'm answering questions without reading them out. So if you don't have your chat open and you're wondering what question I'm answering, then you can open that, but I'll try to introduce it as well. So what, um, what, what might it look like as it progresses? So we all know, We've been around these maturity models, the DuPont Bradley curve, reactive, dependent, independent, um, interdependent. The Hudson model um, goes from pathological through um, reactive, calculative, proactive, generative. So, so we know these models. I don't know what model is the favorite within the mining industry. Um, you might have your own, your own model that is popular within your industry. Um, look, I, I don't... There's a lot of there's a lot of academic debate over the, whether those maturity models are actually a real thing, uh, whether you do actually move through those models, whether you whether you don't. Um, that's a, probably a debate for another day. There's in um, in Viking Sutcliffe's work, which is this 
book, which I've talked about kind of before. Um, they've actually got quite a lot of checklists in relation to each of the five principles where you can actually score yourself maybe on a scale of one to three about where you think you're at. And that would help you identify where your weaknesses might be and where you might be able to um, improve. But there's no kind of maturity models that, as such that says, oh, look, we're not a HRO, but when we do these 10 things, we're going to become a high reliability organisation. Um, but I think there is ways then, because organisations like to like to assess to understand their starting point. They like to move through a, a journey when it comes to safety improvement. Um, anyone want to know about journeys? Andy White's on this call. He's just done a master's thesis on journeys in safety. Um, so look, I think it's important for us to have some way of helping organizations demonstrate progress, but I don't think there's any existing models that are actually going to give it to you. We might, you know, you might have to build something that um, based on what you plan on doing. Um, Dave, I'll, I'll jump in now. I think that's a, that's a very interesting point there that, that you bring up because we, I guess the, the industry's so used to having measures of success for safety programs. And obviously, a lot of the time maybe is linked it into those traditional reactive measures. Um, so if this is probably then moving in that space of, well, well, we'll do X, but we can't guarantee it'll give you Y. It might give you something else, but we can't actually, you know, give you that. So that's probably going to be that sort of paradigm shift associated with this as well. Yeah, there could well be, or you might, we might have to work in and out of those, um, of, 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 um, um, meeting meeting the industry where it's at. So if you are putting new things into place under, underneath an idea of doing HRO type of work, then you're going to implement certain practices um, and and you can measure the 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 frequency and the quality of those of those practices and the improvement around that. You you would hopefully identify some some outcome measures that you can evaluate. But I think you might have to design um, you'll have to design metrics that are specific to what you're doing and what change you're trying to create. But I don't think it would be that hard, given all the work in the HRO space, I don't think it would be that hard to, to build some kind of maturity model. The problem is in the early days, it's not going to have any benchmark data. It, it may not be that reliable, but it, it wouldn't be that hard to, um, to create something that, that helped your organisation understand where it was at. Um, I don't know if something like that exists. As far as I know, it doesn't exist. But in the literature, there's, there's lots of pointers in terms of the questions that you, sh that you could you could ask or customize to get yourself a baseline. So just on that, I'll jump down to Bobby's question because it's related and then um, bounce back up. So um, so in terms of self self assessment, um, Bobby, I can point you to like like I said, I, I'll pull out some stuff and and we can send it through. But this original Viking Sutcliffe book in the early two thousands did actually propose checklists or sets of questions under each of the five principles that you should ask an organization to, to see where, where you're at. The language is 20 years old. So when I looked at it and talked to Christian about it, I said, look, if someone wants to do something with this, I think we should update the language because like some of it just is not, um, like it's before we did anything in safety, before well, we did many things in safety 20 years ago. It's before we did a lot of things that we do now in safety. So I think there's a really good starting point that exists in, in the literature to, to ask people questions. Um, and they even rate themselves like on a scale of one to five, like strongly disagree to strongly agree um, with agree, disagree, neutral in the middle and asking these questions. And it's kind of ready-made question set. You could do it as a self-assessment. You could actually survey your people um, in your operation. It actually wouldn't be much work to build a tool. Um, and and you could you could spider diagram that. You could do anything with that. Um, and you could do that. You, you guys could do that yourself. Um, you wouldn't have industry data around it, but you could have a lot of descriptive data about where your people see you being at. Um, so if anyone's interested in, in some of that, we can point them, point them to that. Um, so Andy said, I know Andy, when he worked on the Antarctic program, we're talking about knowledge transfer, clean skins, you know, knowing who the new people are, having mentoring programs with them. Um, you're never going to capture anything. Um, you've always got to rely on passing things, people to people by the look of that, Andy. Thank you. Okay, um, overriding drive to innovate. So Dennis, yeah, look, this is, this is actually something that I've become a little bit concerned about in safety and I don't quite know how to, um, um, what to do with it yet, but you're right. Like there's a constant drive to improve and change and, and you know, like 
you talk to organizations, they talk about everyone likes the new shiny thing and, and people want to do all the design work of the program, but no one wants to do the hard yards of implementation, let alone sustaining it. There's some management work that says managers have two roles in organizations. One is to actually create improvement and the other is to protect their operation and, and keep their operation stable and understand how their operation is working today and make sure that they don't compromise that by by creating change that undermines what's actually making their organization work at the moment. So I think that role of creating change and protecting operations um, is, is really, really important. When I did my research on safety professionals, I actually found that there was no narrative that we had as safety professionals about protecting operations. All of our narratives and our, our vision of success for our roles and vision of success for our organizations was about change and improvement and journeys and getting them to some place where they weren't today. None of our discussion was about, well, actually our organization is actually functioning pretty well. We're, we're producing stuff, we're profitable, we're, we're our share, we've got lots of shareholders who are, who are happy, but, say, but we as safety professionals don't seem to think about, well, what's the 80% of stuff that is, is, in, is in our organization that's actually currently working really, really well? And what's our role as safety people to actually protect that? And the 20% of time, we can then make improvement on, on top of that. So, Dennis, look, if that's sort of what you're talking about, I think there is a constant organisational push to improve. Um, but I, but if that becomes our entire focus, I actually just think we're creating churn and change and destabilisation, which isn't necessarily good for safe and reliable operations. Um, so... Hey, I'll jump in there. Would you say then, like what you described, is that is that probably where the things like appreciative inquiry and, and learning teams would come in, where you can come in and, and focus on what the organisation is doing well in that BAU environment and maybe leverage off that as opposed to bringing another program through? I think anything, yeah, look, um, I think anything that you do in your organisation, you should treat as a major change. Um, and it's so easy for us to just have an action and we, we flick a checklist into the organisation or we throw something in. And, you know, everything that we do that changes the operation, changes people routines, destabilises, takes extra resource, even if it's five minutes every task. I think, you know, we need to know how that's going to land and, and, and what it's going to do to the operation. So I know that probably isn't that popular a thing to say and saying, oh, geez, just that's going to make life hard to get anything done. But maybe life should be hard to get sort of changes and innovations up because we, we probably want to know that they're going to have the impact that we want them to have um, and, and understand the unintended consequences before we kind of just charge ahead with, with 50 new things and, and, and lump it all on the mine, mine manager and say, make this work. Um, so I don't know, I don't know, um, Christian, if that kind of partly answers the question or, um, or Dennis, but um, my advice would be to think, um, think critically and carefully about everything that we're asking people to do differently or new. Um, so industry that's extremely focused on compliance, black and white decision making, focused on blaming the front line for system failures to HRO thinking. Um, thanks, Tony. Look, I, I, I don't want to judge the industry. I don't know enough about it. I haven't been in it enough. Um, I've only ever been on the sidelines of the mining industry, but you know, that they're the types of things that, um, that I hear. So whether that's true or not, um, I suppose, um, is, is not me, me to decide. But it does make things um, complicated from a HRO point of view because, you know, like I said, Hopkins will talk about reporting cultures and the first thing you need to do to make sure you get the open free flow of information in a reporting culture is to, re is to remove blame um, from, from, system, from, from failures um, at the operational level. And I know that's easier said than done. And, and we need to have, and, and there's all the comments that'll come out about we need to have accountability and, and, and people need to be held responsible and we need to set an example. But if your management strategy is one of kind of fear, so the only way that people are going to do the right things and make good decisions is if because they're worried about being kind of sanctioned. Like that's what you're kind of saying with that approach. This, the blame focus is saying that our management strategy is managed by fear. Um, that's very different to accountability. People can have accountability without being blamed. Um, so there's different ways of thinking about this. So you could read in the just culture space um, or, or something, but I, I think it becomes, so I think something, that's something that you're going to have to address as a site and as an industry about blame and, and, and how to remove that. 
Um, we've worked with a few organizations that have gone down that path and done that. So stood up in front of their organization and said, no one will be, will be disciplined or blamed for any, um, any safety non-compliance or, or any issue. Um, that's a symptom of the way we're managing the organization. And, you know, if people say, oh, yeah, but what about that one person who does the wrong thing? Well, you know, at the end of the day, that's just HR performance management. If someone does the wrong thing and, you know, you can, you can deal with that. But, um, but you don't want to compromise kind of like your whole organization around that. Um, I think on the compliance side, I, you know, these ideas about decluttering and, and I think it came up as a potential topic for another webinar. We've wrote a, written a couple of papers at Griffith on decluttering manage, management systems and compliance programs and, and removing safety work and, and which is kind of how we describe all the safety things that, you know, don't necessarily contribute to the safety of work. So I think if you are industry focused on compliance, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If people do the things that they, they, they should do and they do things in a repeatable way, that, that creates reliability. So that's, that's a, and dependable role performance. That's a good thing. What you don't want is, um, is to have just too much compliance and too much administration. So my view would be um, don't try and change the industry, work with the, the cultural traits of the industry, minimize the amount of compliance that people need to do and make sure the things they're doing are actually really important. Um, and then, you know, try to think about how you address the blame and decision making things. So that was probably a bit of a long and a waffly um, kind of answer, Tony. But um, that's we we could do we could we could have a discussion on just culture, or we could have a discussion on decluttering, and I think that will go to um, your question. Um, so, in a smaller organisation that supports the mining industry. Okay. Sorry, I'm just reading through that. So, Hugh, um, not sure what sort of, I assume, contracting organisation, um, small contracting organisation, um, changing how we assess our safety performance to be the same as we're assessed by clients, a good culture of reporting hazards and opportunities, but more interesting traditional indicators. Okay, and if you've got 500 people, you're going to work a million hours a year. So, you have one incident, you'll have a TRI of one, you have five, you have a TRI of five, and it's going to bounce around all over the place. Um, so that's, that may or may not be, and you're not going to have many of them probably. So that's probably not going to be that helpful. Look, you're going to have to, you're going to have to at least, um, you're going to have to at least be able to report the measures that your clients want, but that doesn't mean that they have to be the measures that you talk about in your own organization. If you, if you want to talk about more different measures, I know we, we know some, um, on our Forgeworks, um, YouTube channel, we've got a presentation by, um, by Josh Bryant, who's the GM of People and Safety at Mitchell Services, which is a drilling contractor, probably works on a couple of your mine sites. You know, they've done a lot to try to um, integrate what they want to do more into this space with um, still reporting what their clients need. So you might want to go and watch that video, Hugh. I can get you a link to that um, if you get in touch. Um, but I think um, I, I think all I'd say is this. I mean, I know we've got operators on the call. I know we've got people from outside industry and contractors, but you know, to be quite quite frank, I'd say you know there's nothing wrong with creating some Chinese walls between your clients and your and your um, your own organisation, not on important safety issues where information needs to flow freely. But if you're trying to develop a certain culture and a certain style, and you're work, working with ten different operators, and those ten different operators have ten different approaches, then you you can either put some walls up and try to um, take your organisation forward, or you can just confuse everyone by having them operate under kind of, you know, different modes at every different site that they go to. Um, but I don't underestimate the challenge. I worked for a long time in a contracting organization um, and, and that is very challenging. All right. I know, okay. we've just got a quick Sorry. one there from Wayne. I'll get out. All right. Did Wayne beat you, Christian? He, or he you did, he did. Like he well done, Wayne. <laughs> Didn't know if you had a pull rank. Um, okay. Explain how to do the reluctance to simplify. Some things we want to simplify, some things we don't. Deliberately making material by simplifying the controls that save lives, but oversimplifying, yeah, okay. So Wayne, you, you kind of got it there. Um, look, you know, like I said in one of the earlier webinars, people get through life, we get through life by recognizing patterns and simplifying things and only spending effort or, you know, our, our brain, you know, cognitive effort on things that, you know, are new or novel or different, um, everything else we can dismiss. That's why you can watch that. You know that basketball video where it says, you know, count the number of passes there are or something like that. And there's this gorilla walking around. And when you're given the task, you kind of don't see the gorilla. And then it says now 
can you spot the gorilla? And then you you watch it and you you see it. Um, I don't know. You, and then you go, ah, oh, surely it's a different video. But look, we we like to simplify things, and organisations like to simplify. They like dashboards and traffic lights and um, all of that sort of stuff. So, um, look, you, you're always going to have to search through the um, the you know the haystack to find the needles um, when it comes to weak signals. So, like on it, on any given day, okay, if this job planned to do in six hours but it took twelve hours, then you you. You know, I'd say you need to understand why it took 12 hours and not six hours and, and, and what do you need to learn from, from that. Um, if your production for a month was 5% down, then you want to understand why it's 5% down and what do you need to learn from that and, and, and is it due to kind of the changing nature of risk in your organisation or something. So I'd say, you know, you don't want to simplify things that go to the core of your operations, like your task or your production or your resourcing. Um, you, can, you can simplify things that are remote kind of from the work and the risk. So, um, so I guess I guess what I'd say is um, is you're going to simplify some stuff. Don't simplify stuff that's that's close to your operation. You know, and at least until you you understand it at more than a kind of surface level. When it comes to controls, um, I know that through ICMM and that I know your industry has got a strong critical control management program. We do a lot of work with organisations on their on their critical control management programs. Um, you. You know, you need to be careful here that um, that you don't simplify too much, and you also don't standardise too much. You know, across different sites because there's different controls, and the nature of risk is different on different sites. Um, so I, I'd put a lot of effort into making sure your your critical control program is is working the way you want it to work. Um, and then when it comes to accident investigations, um, Wayne, I think every industry could do accident investigations a lot better. Um, just for a bit of advice. Um, we work with one organization and reshape their incident management system. And now when they do their incident management, they, they look at the incident and then they go and look at five jobs the same, um, which didn't have the incident. So they try to understand how the work is normally done, how the work happened in, on this occasion, what's kind of systemic, what was you know only specific to that particular situation. And they probably spend five times the effort investigating their incidents to understand it as, as they used to. You know, and they don't do administrative controls. They get blank, blanket ban on administrative controls and things like that. So it takes time, and you've got to have resource to do that. But if you can reallocate some of that resource from other tasks to, you know, deeply understand uh, why you weren't able to prevent something um, or why something didn't go as planned, you you still do want to do that. And HRO theory is pretty good because it still talks about learning from. You know, I think it's like a, a, a uh, almost insatiable desire to learn from why the operation's not running as it's expected to run and whether that be five percent off on tonnage or a job six hours late or we had this incident that we didn't plan for um almost insatiable kind of desire to get to the absolute bottom of that um so there's a few requests for the link so we'll we've got a we'll get a copy of the chat anyone who's asked you know if there's a couple of people asked for something we'll We'll um, flick those those links around and um, we'll, we'll send it out with the pack. Share those with people. Share the details of the books, which are already in the slides anyway. Um, okay, Dennis, we need to understand that complex stuff becomes simpler as your expertise grows. We often want to simplify, so we do not need expertise, and that's where it falls over. So look, Dennis, look, there is um. So the Dunning-Kruger effect kind of talks about this, that people go through a curve where they become kind of like um, unconsciously incompetent, where you actually don't know that you don't know something and then you, you know, then you work way through being consciously incompetent. So you, you learn a little bit and then you realise how much you kind of don't know. Um, and then you kind of become, you know, then you, you make your way through this, this curve. So um, the worst thing is to kind of um, think, so to not know anything and, and think that you do. And also then to actually think you're an expert when you're actually not. And that's where you'll find like, you know, the real true experts on things, they actually, um, they, they still ask lots of questions and they still, you know, constantly trying to, to figure out what they, where their gaps in their knowledge are. Um, so I, I don't know whether there's, you know, I don't know if there's a question in, in there, in there, Dennis, but, um, but yeah, I think it's, um, it's dangerous when people know just enough of it. Well, I think in, there's a saying about that, isn't it? You know, know enough to be dangerous. Um, and I think that is, you know, you need to be nervous where people um, know just enough to be dangerous. 
So Dave, that's we're up to date on the chat log. I'm just going to jump forward. Uh, we'll come back to that one. Um, so this one I think's pretty pretty relevant here. So we've got um, you know this this is pointing to we've got some large multinationals, key decision makers can be in different cities, towns, maybe even different countries, and yep. yet we're we're really looking for free fast flow of information you know, in, inside that type of environment. So wondering your thoughts in that space. Yeah, look, um, let me, let me throw fire some thoughts at it. Um, and we'll, um, so remaining sensitive. So, so thinking about the way you engage with sites, I suppose from offsite people. So, you know, how often do you engage and what do you engage around? Who sets the agenda for that engagement? So how much time does the site have to direct what that engagement looks like and what, in, and, 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 and make requests and have their needs met. So if you really wanted to be kind of sensitive to operations, I'd be doing like a weekly ops meeting with, with the site where I did nothing but listen and to what was going on. So just tell us what's happening this week on your site. Where are you at? You know, what are you worried about this week? Um, what do you need from the resources offsite to support? You know, so, so if you're really going to do it, you'd have a one week, a weekly ops call where you actually, it wasn't, nothing was going down to site. It was all just, coming up and, and offers of help and support and, and needs and that, um, and then acting on that for the rest of the week. And it's probably one of the more important roles you could do. I, I started doing a lot of that in my role, in my last role, which was calling around all the equivalent mine managers on a Monday morning and finding out what was going on that week at the site, you know, where they were mobilizing new contractors and where they were doing high, you know, high, high safety risk type of operations um, and making sure that they had all the support they needed and, giving them some support up the hierarchy to get some decisions made that were being stalled and things like that. So I guess I'd, I'd look at the way you engage with, with sites and who's driving the agenda and how much support you're providing. Um, and then, you know, also what information you're requesting to form your view of how the site's being managed. So if you're getting monthly reports of incidents and one site's had three incidents and one site's had one incident, so you say, oh, there must be problems on the site that's got three incidents. I mean, that's not very sensitive to operations and you shouldn't be making decisions on that. So those things are kind of related. Thinking about what information flows you're getting and, you know, and, and you know, how you're then using that to make decisions about resource allocation and support. Um, so, yeah, you could do that quite simply, just, just auditing and, and, and taking an inventory of, you know, what the, interaction, what the interactions look like between sites and corporates, what the flows of information look like between sites and corporates, how balanced that is. Um, how the people at both ends or particularly at the operational end feel about those engagements and those requests, um, you know, and the support that's being provided or not provided. Um, you can test how sensitive your team is to operations by, you know, even doing some basic um, data gathering and research. So this might not appeal to everyone, but, you know, asking, asking a mine manager about what the, what the top couple of things that they're worried about are. And then going into your corporate safety team and saying, oh, so mining manager X, you know, what do you think are the top couple of things they're worried about at the moment? And just seeing how close to the answers that you get or how different the answers um, that you get are. And that'll give you a pretty good idea about how connected um, your offsite organization is to your site organization and how, how the information's flowing. Um, lots of ways to do that, but I think all organizations would probably benefit from spending a bit of time looking at that on-site, on off-site engagement and information flow that's that's good dave we're still up to date on the chat log so it might be it's getting close to five two we'll go back uh in the pack there bear with me because there was a question yeah bobby just around a mining case study or anything similar to that so look i did another dig through through the um internet i'm still i'm still don't know if i've got to the bottom of it but i can't find much at all there's a few there's a few references to HRO in very small specific things in the mining sector, but, um, and forward research agendas and things like that. But I can't see any sort of case studies of, of organizations that have done this and published it. Um, I still don't know the industry well enough to know if there's companies that have, that have grappled with these processes. The oil and gas industry has, but that's again, mainly driven by professor Hopkins, um, first book on Texas city called failure to learn, which was the BP Texas city refinery refinery explosion in 2005. So when his book came out, that drove a lot of activity 10 years ago in the oil and gas industry. Um, and 
a lot of that's fallen away now because they were kind of people saw them as communication and cultural and worker behavior change programs as opposed to more systemic um, um, reviewing how their organization function functioned. Okay, so Bobby, you know more than me about it. Peter Wilkinson's done some implementation of HRO mining. So cool, I'm gonna go and try and track that down and see what I can find then, um, Bobby, or if you can try to connect me and me, that would be great. Very good. There you go. So you are moving faster than I can than I am aware of. Very good. So it sounds like um, Dr. Brady's having a seminar in July or attending a seminar in July with Peter Wilkinson. So what I'll do maybe, Christian, is I'll, I might, or Bobby might have some information or I might be able to dig out some information. I might be able to, um, to send some stuff. Okay. So in the chat, um, Bobby's put some great information. I'd encourage you if you are in the industry, um, it sounds like the QRC is going to be organizing something um, and we will hopefully get um, asked Bobby if she'll forward it on to us and we can forward it out to everyone. Um, that would be, that would be awesome. If, if someone's done some work in it, then yeah, find it, learn from it. Um, and, and speak to Dr. Brady. He obviously reviewed a lot of this HRO literature when he made it a recommendation in his report as well. He reviewed a lot of Hopkins work and that sort of thing. So, and Hopkins was heavily cited in the Brady report. So, um, yeah, and I know, so very good. Yep. That's good. All right. Well, Dave, in terms of questions, I think we're, we're out of time. So we'll move to the wrap up component here. Um, there might be a final flurry of a question. Maybe someone's really, really quick. Um, so I guess um, similar slide to what's been sent out previous. So there's a links to that, um, to the information that's come previously, the books there, the, the podcast, which I really recommend you, you check out that, that Dave and, and Drew Ray do. There'll be some other links um, to come out as well. And then the one that Dave's referenced um, in this, the, the YouTube video, we'll get a hold of that. And, and send that out as well. Um, but we've talked about this a few times and Dave even make, um, made reference there about the maturity assessment. Um, and I guess with what you talked about up front, Dave, you know, with this parliamentary inquiry, it's, it's not that HRO is gonna go away. It's probably, you know, just gonna take on a whole life of its own pretty soon. Yeah, and I don't think that's so. So we shouldn't look at that as a bad thing either. Mm. Um, sorry, Christian, I know we're, we're at time, but um, it's one of the better theories that Brady could have put into the report. Like I've said earlier, um, it's pretty broad and it's it's it, it integrates safety with reliable operations. There's a lot of great great stuff in there. So if we can just stay ahead of the curve um, and and start to try to figure out how to do it well in our organisations and where to start, I, I actually think this could be a really really this could be a good thing. Well, should be a good thing. For, um, for the sector to kind of build on what you've already done. Agree, agree. Thanks, Dave. Um, so look, we, we we got pushed into these these webinars. I know there's a oh, squillion- mate, we didn't get pushed into it. We, there's there's a squillion, squillion, squillion webinars happening at the moment for any, anything you can, you can think of, but um, as a result of the COVID-19 stuff, but it looks like, and listening to the feedback, um, these are being well received. And so we're seeing that there's some momentum there and, and already some people have talked about some other, other topics that we, that we might look, like to consider. Um, and please, you know, reach out to us and, and let us know. But I think this will probably be the third of, of many in a, in a series. And it, and it sounds like this structure and format works pretty well. A little bit of content, a lot of Q&A to really dive down deep there on that. So look, that's, you know, from us, look, please keep the, the comments going through. Uh, appreciate that, but that's it. So. Farewell to everyone and we'll chat again next time. So thanks for joining us. Bye-bye. Thanks everyone.